What is up, YouTube? What is up, Canada? Really excited to be talking to you about today's video. We're also on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention Instagram, but we're going to be talking about quantum computing in finances and in particularly what's going on in Canada when it comes to quantum computing. We're actually doing some kind of cool stuff as Canadians. So anyways, first, let's cover what is quantum computing? What is its applications for finance as well as you know, how's Canada positioned when it comes to other countries and other, you know, technological leaders when it comes to uh, quantum computing. So classical computers, even today, supercomputers deal with what's called bits. Now, these aren't the bits that your grandpa awkwardly brought up when he was trying to explain the birds and the bees to you. Um, in fact, these bits can be firmly defined as either a zero or a one at any given time. The combination of these zeros and ones compromise all the processes that our best computers can handle today. So instead of using bits, they use quantum bits called qubits. And these qubits are made of either protons, electrons, or other subatomic particles. And so they can be in a state of superposition. Uh, they don't have to be defined as strictly a zero or a one at any given time. But in classical computing, they are. It's a, you're either a zero or you're a one, and that's how the bits work, and that's how we're able to create uh, complex processes. Rather, though, with super uh, superposition, um, they can either be a zero or a one simultaneously or some sort of combination of zero and one. So this is a little bit complex and we're not going to be able to explain all of quantum physics, obviously, in one quick uh, YouTube live video. But if you guys are interested, I really do encourage you to explore it. Um, I can remember back in university, the first time I kind of stumbled into uh, the idea of quantum physics and quantum computing was through science fiction books, like uh, fantasy and science fiction books. And that led me down the rabbit hole of just like self-researching this. Found it fascinating. And it really even helped me think about um, the universe and infinity and a lot of things differently. Um, so due to the wider range of possibilities uh, that superposition allows, the qubits can be in an exponentially more states than bits because those states are either a zero or a one. So as we're essentially like computing um, different options, right? Or calculations or scenarios. Well, if we have to be a zero or a one, it takes a lot more computing than if we can compute zero and one at the same time. Uh, I probably did not explain that well. I apologize. Uh, but so again, the qubits can be exponentially in more states than bits because of that. So the second revolutionary aspect of qubits is their ability to become entangled. Again, this was something about quantum uh, physics that I found fascinating. Um, so when we're talking about entanglement, it's the process in which two qubits, no matter the distance between them, are able to interact with each other in concrete ways, such as exhibiting as a zero or a one uh, value when measured. So when superposition and entanglement are combined, this is when things get really cool. They can compute things that classical computers would simply take too long to compute. For example, in 2019, a quantum computer performed a complex task in three minutes that would take even the best supercomputers a thousand years. The reason for this boils down to the actual processes these computers undertake. So for a given simulation, classical computers have to check each outcome to determine the outcome was correct. Whereas qubits of quantum computers can be manipulated to automatically rule out the outcomes that are incorrect. And that superimposition essentially like it's a zero and a one at the same time. Uh, this is not going to be a great analogy, but zero and one at the same time. And essentially like it just forces itself into the right position the first time because it tries all positions in an instance where a classical computer has to try each one through brute force because it's trying zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, you know, and going through that where we can do zero and ones at the same time and essentially try out all scenarios at once. So now let's bring quantum computing into finances. So quantum computers can tackle large data sets with ease to assess risk and do it faster than anything else. And quantum computing can help us solve optimization challenges, such as how to optimize a personal financial portfolio. So quantum computers can solve these challenges faster, process real-time data faster, and avoid the background noise to focus on factors that truly matter. A lot of banks rely on algorithms and machine learning to determine investment opportunities. But as the market becomes more complex, and as they are, the computing power required becomes greater as well and which leads to a cost benefit issue. Quantum computers have the potential to solve this problem by greatly reducing the amount of computing power and therefore money and time needed to assess the markets. Now, understand, quantum computing again is still in its infancy, so it's not like tomorrow you're gonna to have a quantum laptop, or at least I don't think so. That'd be super cool if we could, but understand quantum, quantum physics and everything we're talking about here, especially with quantum computing, leads to an interesting issue in, uh, uh, cryptography, I pulled that word off. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it. Smash the like button if you're happy I did, because I know I am. 
But it uses algorithms such as, you know, Shor's algorithm to factor large numbers into prime numbers. Quantum computers are really the first computers that can factor these large numbers in a time constrained environment. This can improve encryption immensely, making all of our technologies, including cryptocurrency, safer. However, at the same time, this means that a lot of our encryption currently would also become a lot easier to crack. So, like, um, I can remember reading a book on... Uh, cryptography where it was really exploring ancient cryptography and brought it into the modern era and the future era with um, potentially quantum computing. And so both quantum encryption as well as quantum like ciphering, both have fascinating use cases, will definitely have impacts in, you know, in everything that we do, if we're able to get this to a practical level. And so that's often the challenges with some of these new and unique technologies is really being able to drive them into a practical use. But before we get to a summary here, let's talk about Canada and our role in quantum computing. So Canada, somewhat surprisingly for me, is well positioned when it comes to the quantum computing field. So research by the National Research Council, uh, very creative name there, guys, estimated that Canada would take 8% of the global quantum computing market, which is actually double the normal share we hold in technology. So we're twice as good as normal when it comes to quantum computing compared to our other computing um, and technology industries. So this could create an $8 billion industry, it's projected by 2030. And Canada actually ranks third in the world when it comes to patent filings. However, we are a distant third. So the US uh, filed nearly half of the 3000 patents over the last two years when it comes to quantum computing, and China filed around 400. Canada, on the other hand, came in third and filed numbers in the low double digits. So still, there are some you know, shining stars here in Canada. And one of the companies that we thought we'd talk about briefly is D-Wave Systems. It's ranked fifth in the world in patents, and you know they've sold the world's first commercial quantum computer back in 2011. The main problem that Canada faces in a competitive quantum computing industry is protecting its IP, intellectual property. So one way we have trouble with this is sometimes our business scientists' collaborations are published publicly to the scientists scientific community before any patents are uh, filed, leaving our precious technology findings vulnerable to be copied and possibly losing immense monetary value. And now again, this is a really interesting subject matter, a lot of nuances. We're not going to be able to cover all of it in a short YouTube video, but I do want this to be a two-way conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how Canada's approaching it and whether you think we should be a little bit more careful with some of our technologies or whether actually the entire world should just file less patents and we should be sharing more. And also the incentive for protecting IP isn't large enough for relatively small companies. So they are trying to run a business and the breakthroughs they make today may become obsolete or may take 10 years to really be fully realized and commercialized. In which case, it, again, doesn't really make sense. Tie up your precious limited resources to file a patent for everything that you maybe stumble upon. And lastly, the fact that our firms are small leaves them vulnerable to acquisition, buyout or bankruptcy. So their main competitors are like IBM and Intel. These are monstrous corporations. And so it will be difficult for Canadian tech to be able to go toe to toe with them. However, there is also speed and that agility of being nimble and small. So, you know, problems are profits. Am I right? And finally, uh, you know, so far, these companies are working with us, um, signified by the fact that Google and NASA have bought D-Wave's quantum computing machines for $10 million. So nobody knows the future holds when it comes to quantum computing. But it seems like it could be a huge stepping stone for our entire species, as well as potentially a great boon for the Canadian economy if we continue to stay as one of the leaders when it comes to patent filings and just technological discoveries in the field of quantum computing. So again, this is kind of an interesting topic. I hope you guys enjoyed this kind of veering off into a little bit more of a future tech play here. But as always, I do want this to be a two-way conversation. So please engage with us in the comments, whether you're watching this live or after the fact, we really do appreciate it. And I try and respond to every comment these days on these live news videos. So I want to give a shout out to Ian Jack and uh, everyone else that's watching this video. Really appreciate you guys. If you haven't done so already, smash that like button, hit subscribe if you're new to my channel. And remember, sharing is caring. No one else is going to share this video unless you guys do it. So I hope you do. Thank you guys. And we'll see you in the next video tomorrow.